I'm Angino. Welcome to the Mangino Talks Pittsburgh podcast. We talk about everything that matters to us all, from current events to Pittsburgh history, social issues to sports, politics, to practical day-to-day life. And today, we're talking about Robert Bowers, the Tree of Life synagogue massacre, 11 people losing their lives, and now the case is before the jury at the time of this recording. Now, it's quite possible that between now and the time that this actually posts, the jury could come back with a decision. But I want to let you all know that this is being recorded prior to their decision. Uh, News out this morning that, yes, uh, they did ask for uh, a viewing of some of the evidence, and we'll talk about that in this piece. Uh, But first, I want to start off with the issue of what does justice look like? Because there's a debate that is going on right now regarding the issue of justice when it comes to the victims and their families and whether or not you can have justice truly if Robert Bauer's life is ultimately spared. Or does it only occur, justice that is, if his life is taken just like their lives have been taken? Now, here's what we know. He is guilty. He's been found guilty. What is it? 63 different counts. The feds brought against him. Guilty verdicts on the counts. He is eligible for death. He is either going to be punished for the natural life that he has within him for whatever years that may be in a prison cell or his life is going to be taken from him. It isn't as though he's going to get off scot-free. It isn't as though he's going to get a slap on the wrist. I asked this in a post a couple of days ago, which would you prefer, life in prison where you are in a concrete cell for 22 hours a day, and even when you go to recreation, more than likely considering the crime that he's committed and how dangerous he may be or others may be to him, there are reports he's going to recreate completely by himself inside of a cage. He's not going to have any real contact with anyone except for the jail guard who ushers him from his cell to his workout cage and then back again for whatever level of activity there may be. Maybe, maybe. Hardly a life that anybody would want to live. Uh, There are animals that are in zoos that have more freedom and more mobility and more interaction with other living beings than this man is going to have if he's placed in prison for life without the possibility of parole. And I asked, would you rather have that or would you have death? And there were a lot of people who said, listen, just end my life already. Just go ahead and take it. How is it a life worth living? And I get the point. I really do. I mean, imagine for the rest of your days, whatever you may have ahead of you, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Some people who are looking at life in prison without the possibility of parole, like Bowers is looking at with crimes that were committed in their 20s, they're looking at a half a century or more in isolation. Why would anybody want to fight to preserve that? Especially for those individuals who believe that there is no afterlife. Aren't you better off going to a lack of existence than living through that for the rest of your days? I would think so. Now, if I had to choose between isolation for the next 50 years and hell, listen, I'm putting off hell as long as I can. Thank you very much. But to the contrary, and lack of a belief in that within one's own mind, uh, why wouldn't you take not existing any longer? There are those on the defense side, the uh, defense attorney and her team, that are wanting to preserve life so desperately, even for those who are the most heinous of criminals. Now, when it comes to the death sentence, I have a difficult time with it. And in this sense, I have a difficult time. There are those that have been sentenced to death that we know have been then found to be innocent. Not, not guilty on a technicality. They just didn't do it. Uh, we have people who are serving life prison sentences 
that have been discovered to be innocent. They didn't do the crime, period. And we've been able to release them. My concern about the death sentence is that we are an infallible people. We have witnesses with fallible memories. We have prosecutors that are fallible, police officers that are fallible. Some of them, uh, some of them so far is they're willing to put away somebody that is innocent just to be able to say they got somebody on this particular crime. That doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't. If you have a murderer and you try the wrong person for murder, but you want to get the guilty verdict because you want to come off as though you're the tough-on crime prosecutor or you're the police that just want to get the guy, but it's the wrong guy, it's a terrible injustice to that individual and to the victims and their families and then whoever is then victimized next because you didn't get the right guy. And so when it comes to the death sentence, I have an aversion to it because you can't fix it. You can't make it right in any sense of the word. Now, somebody who's been in prison for 15, 20 years, wrongfully convicted, you can't give them the 15 or 20 years back. But you can give them the rest of their days back to them in freedom. You can give them something to try to make up for the time that was lost. Some degree of financial comfort for what you, we put them through as a society. And they are do that. But when you come to an individual like a Robert Bowers, it's different. We all know with an absolute certainty that this man killed these 11 worshipers of God. We know it so completely that his own defense doesn't even dispute it. They didn't even bother to push back at all during the earliest phases of the trial in determining his innocence or guilt. They readily admit his guilt. So from that standpoint, the issue of the death sentence I don't have a problem with because I genuinely believe that there are crimes that individuals can commit that are so heinous, they're worthy of death. And killing 11 people as they are worshiping God as their conscience would dictate would qualify as that. It clearly would. What's also interesting, too, is that when you think about the deliberations that are going on right now, it's one thing for us to have academic conversations about the death penalty and who should get it and who shouldn't get it and when should it be employed and when should it not. And you have these sometimes fictitious individuals that you imagine that would be eligible for it or not. And then you have these individuals that you can, that we have in our own history, this person should, this person should not. And there's a difference though. When you look at these 12 individuals who were in the jury deliberation and they're making a decision as to whether somebody lives or dies. I mean, think about that for a moment. Imagine the weight that you must have coming down on you that your vote could easily be the one that determines whether this individual lives or dies. Now, there very well may be individuals that are on the jury that are saying, you know what, death, easy, not a problem. But then there are others who are struggling, and they realize the longer that they struggle, the more that they struggle, the greater the weight that comes down upon them. And then they have to be able to live with the knowledge that their vote took somebody's life. Tremendous burden. Tremendous. Because even though a person who horribly kills 11 like this, it's awfully difficult to find any degree of sympathy for it, any degree of compassion for it, especially when the individual is so convinced that they did the right thing, they have no remorse whatsoever. But then you have people who have consciences that go beyond that. I have a tremendous amount of compassion for the jurors that are deliberating this. I truly do. 
One of the things that was brought up by Judy Clark, who's leading the defense, was that the jurors were asked a question. In fact, they were given a 26-page questionnaire. And in that, they were asked whether or not they would meaningfully consider any mitigating evidence presented to them. And she said this in closing arguments. We believe you then and we believe you now. You have someone else's life in your hands. And they're hoping that the testimony of family and some of their expert witnesses, if not all of them, would give jurors a reason to believe that this person is suffering from a mental illness that um, would give them pause for executing someone. Going so far as to say that when it comes to those who are mentally ill, we don't kill them, do we? When it comes to those who are mentally ill, she said in a quote, is that who we kill? Well, when it comes to those who are mentally ill, I don't think of criminally mentally ill. If you have someone who has an IQ that would clearly be viewed as mentally challenged, and then they do something, and they have a difficult time, if not impossible time of being able to truly reconcile what it is that they did, the seriousness of the crimes that they are being charged with, their ability to participate in their own defense, then I can have a compassion for that level of mental illness. But criminally, mentally ill? That's pretty difficult, isn't it? Sure is to me. Another issue that was brought up was that they had an expert witness, Dr. George Corbin, who claimed that with medication, Bowers could likely eventually come out of those delusions and realize what he had done because he still believes that what he did was the right thing. Is it not fair to argue that, one, if he's not come out of it in the past four, four and a half years, he's not going to come out of it? In fact, if you were going to go with a defense that, yes, he did it, and you want to preserve his life, then you would have encouraged him to get all the medical treatment he could have possibly received, diagnoses and treatment, and then have the expert testimony of those doctors who were treating him for these mental illnesses. But if he's not being treated, then it's awfully difficult to make that argument, isn't it? If not impossible. And if he is being treated and it's accomplishing nothing, what do you do with that? How do you make the argument that he could be turned around? Experts testifying saying that, listen, if you give him life in prison, it's going to be pretty horrible. And I'm guessing that when it comes to jurors, in order to reconcile in your mind that you're not going to impose death, you want to believe that Life is going to be difficult. It's going to be without much joy whatsoever. It's going to be painful, if you will. And they brought on a couple of expert witnesses. Maureen Baird, a former federal prison warden who retired back in 16. She served in the federal prisons for upwards of 30 years as a uh, former warden. And uh, there was another person as well, uh, Miss Purdue, Janet Purdue, another former BOP warden. And they both work as consultants with this organization called Prisonology. And they testified on the defense behalf regarding the difficult time that he's going to experience, that they believe that more than likely he'll go to ADX in Colorado. And in ADX, He'll be there because he will be a target himself because of the heinousness of the crime, that there's somehow a righteousness within prisoners, which is, has always been a very comical thing to me, that even those who are doing a hard time in state and federal prisons view people as being so bad as like, you know what, you're a piece of scum. I got to take your life from you. Think about that. They don't see themselves as being as bad as somebody else, and they think it's somebody who's worse than they are, that they feel the need to go ahead and end their life and assault them, you know, try to kill them. Ms. Baird said that life in this prison is going to be harsh, that he will be sleeping 
on a concrete bed, concrete walls, there will be practically no creature comforts. Potentially, if he behaves himself, he could earn privileges or maybe a little bit more recreation time, maybe more phone calls, maybe more trivia and bingo games and other approved arts and craft materials, but still in isolation for the rest of his days. When you think of the defense attorney that he has, Judy Clark, she's represented some of America's worst. Eric Rudolph, who killed three in four bombings carried out over two years in the mid-1990s, including the Centennial Olympic Park bombing. Zokar Sarnev, the surviving Boston Marathon bomber. He's housed there. Eric Rudolph housed there. Terry Nichols co-conspirator in the Oklahoma City bombing, 161 life sentences he's serving. And she represented them, Sarnev, Rudolph, and Kaczynski. She's extremely gifted at what she does as a defense attorney and her ability to plead for the lives of those who have no lives worthy of pleading for, in my estimation. But she does. Janet Perdue said that his potential being a target is also a risk of the good order of the facility and something that you may not care about if he dies and gets attacked. One of the things that's brought up is that it's an issue of concern for the staff, for those guards, because when there is a ruckus like that, they, too, can be injured in the process. Deliberations that are going on today, jurors asked to view weapons that were used in the shooting. And both the prosecution and the defense both said yes to the idea of them being able to view them. And so they came into the courtroom and defense attorneys and prosecution attorneys were watching as they were looking at the firearms. Several of the jurors spoke to each other, started asking questions and especially to one U.S. Marshal that was there to observe. And so as the questions were going on, it was then asked that the jury would be excused. And then they wanted to know from the warden, from the marshal rather, what was asked. So he was sworn in and said the first question he was asked was, were the handguns, where were the handguns were carried? And he said, I don't know. And then he was asked about how to load a shotgun. And his answer was from the bottom and the side. And then a juror asked, is that the magazine for the AR? And he said, I said, yes. With that, the defense said they want a mistrial. And that makes legal sense to me because you're looking for every single angle you could possibly get for your client. The prosecution said it's not worthy of a mistrial. Let's just go ahead and tell them to ignore what it is that he said and go back and deliberate. Judge agreed. And so the judge issuing this directive to the jurors, you should disregard completely anything said to you and overheard between any questions between jurors and the marshals. It's not evidence. And you should completely disregard those communications. And then back to the deliberations, they go. So here's my question for you. Is there justice if it's life in prison without the possibility of parole, never freedom to be had? Is there only justice if there's a death penalty that is carried out? Can you appreciate the enormity of the weight that's on these jurors in deciding life or death and having that much power in your hands that somebody lives or somebody dies? And if you were facing the choices of either living in a concrete cell for 22 hours a day, practically, in complete isolation from anybody but maybe the jail guard, and then having your life taken from you, which would you choose? I encourage you to put your comments in the comments below. Uh, interested in finding out what you think? Remember, uh, you can always contact me, Mangino, at ManginoTalks.com is the email address.
And I want to thank you for listening to the Mangino Talks podcast. Please be sure to click the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And by the way, new episodes drop Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Pittsburgh time. For more on me and the show, be sure to visit ManginoTalks.com. If there's a topic that you would like me to talk about or a guest that you would like me to have on, send me an email at Mangino at ManginoTalks.com. Follow me on your favorite social media platform by using at Mangino Talks. And then once you find me, wherever you find me, please like, follow, subscribe, and share the pages with your friends and your family. And thanks again for listening to the Mangino Talks Pittsburgh podcast. Oh, I want to talk to you.